Okay, let's get back into comparative modeling again. Uh, and the idea really is we want to, oh, the question is, can we predict protein structure? And the first idea is, oh, it starts from the observation that we saw that proteins with similar sequences have similar structures. If I take one protein, uh, and for, for the sake of staying in the language here, uh, we call it the target or the query, as you typically would call it in uh, computer science. You have a query protein, uh, and for this query protein, you want to predict the structure. Now, you suspect that the database of proteins that has three dimensional structures, PDB, has one protein in it that is similar to my query. And this is the so called template that I will use to predict the structure. And that in this slide here is called H. How can I find H? And the answer is very simple. I mean, you know all of that, we just discussed it. I just want somebody, ideally, who has not spoken up so far to repeat that statement. So I have a protein in it. I suspect that there is a protein in the database PDB that is similar to my protein, a query protein Q. My question is, how do I? What process do I do, or what method do I apply, or what do I do in order to find out whether my suspicion is right? And again, this somebody, I'd like an answer from somebody who has not made any contribution of any sort today, except for walking in here. This is not a bad contribution. This is not. Don't don't get me wrong. I just want to somehow involve more people. Yes. Exactly. So you do exactly what, what we have done so far. Uh, we identify the template typically with simple pairwise alignments. That's what we can do in the daylight zone here. Uh, that's last. A more advanced search would happen with psi blast, so that's a sequence profile search. And more advanced, even something such as HH blitz threading, we didn't talk about. But comparative modeling methods do do these steps. So essentially, threading means you do, when you do the comparison of the two, you also consider structural features. So, considering structural features, one way in which you could do that is that you say, well, okay, my alignment that I have so far that I showed you implies that on what I know is a three dimensional structure, there would be two negatively charged residues next to each other. And you know this cannot be quite true, so you try to change that. Uh, that is one way in which you can imagine the word threading. But again, this will not be in the examination. Uh, so you align the target and the template to uh, a very detailed alignment. And then you build a model. Build a model. How would you do that? In the simplest way in which you can imagine it. So you have a protein for which you know the three dimensional structure. You have another protein, Q, your query, you know it's sequence similar. You don't know its structure. This one you know the structure for. How would you do it? How would you build a model? Build a model essentially means predict the structure for Q. What's the simplest thing you can do? Yes? Parts. Yes. So you map the similar parts, meaning you have an alignment. The alignment implies, so that's my three dimension structure. This, uh, this particular three dimensional structure has only five residues because my fingers don't give you more. Uh, and in the alignment, sequence based, so when they have laid flat out 1D string alignment, you have the corresponding ones in Q. So you know whatever corresponds and you take the ones in the corresponding Q at the same position. So for each finger you know where it maps and for that finger you simply put it on the three-dimensional coordinate that you have in the PDB file. Okay? That's the simplest model you can do. Now, in the simplest model you, you can do, so the next step then would be to assess the model. How well, how good is it? Now in this simple process, what could go wrong? Can you give me some example? Just yeah. 
So these two things may, yes, so he says the two may not have the same length and then the, the, this thing doesn't fit. Completely true and that is a whole bunch of problems but I'd like to stay on the example that I gave you here where I have the five that match. Okay, I just take off the coordinates for those five. So I don't have the problem that my original protein is 50 or much longer than five. I have those five. But what could go wrong with even the coordinate transfer here for those five? Can you think about a, problem, a couple of problems? Yes? They might have a different secondary structure. So they might... Well... Well, so the, the statement here is they may have a different secondary structure. Uh, that is true and then the, this, this, this inference would be wrong. So ultimately what you are saying is that the inference may be wrong because in fact these two things do not have the same three-dimensional structure and because they don't have the same three-dimensional structure they also don't have the same secondary structure. So you make, make a mistake. True. It may be wrong. So it may just be the wrong decision because you may have said that from my sequence comparison I believe that Q and the protein in the PDB have a similar structure but I was wrong. True. That's true. But I say, assume that in principle, actually, they are not, I'm not wrong. They actually have a similar structure. So essentially, somehow they are similar, but still could go wrong. Yeah? The temperature, the defector of temperature, that it might actually change. So he says that the B factor, this is again something that you did in an examination, that determines how flexible, how movable, how dynamic each residue is. That inference of the B factor may be wrong. That's true, but you guys, I mean, this is, this is a step ahead. Uh, first of all, I have five coordinates, or in, in a real, so I say five because I have five fingers. Let's, let's, let's forget my five fingers. Uh, they're important to me, but in, 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 a, in a protein world, we typically have things that are 50 or 100 residues long, okay? So I have 100 residues for which I look up, 100, for 100 positions I look up the coordinates. Uh, and I, the look up could be wrong. I could sort of make wrong inferences at the end of the day. But before all of that, and just transferring these hundred for, uh, coordinates for 100 points, for 100 residues, what could, not, what could also go wrong? Can you imagine things? Yeah? I mean, they can have a similar structure to the map and they look completely wrong and they can lose uh, the coordinates so you can lose some of it. Yes, but that is back to the problem. So if, if the two are not, don't have the same structure, so I'm wrong, right? My mapping is completely wrong. Yes, that could happen. Or my mapping could be partially wrong. Meaning that for maybe uh, 75 of my 100 residues, the mapping was right. But then there are some where the mapping just was wrong. Could be. But let's assume that essentially, well, let's, let's, let's drill it down. Say, uh, it could well be true that for individual residues, the mapping is wrong. Individual residues mean for one or two. And why could that be, for instance, the case? Why could it be slightly wrong? Yeah? Maybe those changes are the crucial Yes, but if, so he says maybe they are crucial residues, so they are more important residues, and if they are more important, they may not be more important, they may not be in both more important. Is that what you're trying to say? And the features are not the same. One is panophobic and the other one is panophobic. That's the point I meant. Um, so, he, he argues that, okay, so far in my example here, I turned, I, I simply took the coordinates for whatever is the corresponding position. I did not ask does the corresponding position in fact have the same features? Which brings us back to what I briefly mentioned before. It could be that, for instance, alignments have insertions, remember? It could be that in the protein, in my query protein, in fact, my five residues in fact are seven, and there are two additional seven here, and between these two that happen to be negatively charged residues, there is something else. That something else doesn't exist in the structure. In the structure, the corresponding points would be close to 3D structure. But two negatively charged residues cannot be close to the 3D structure. This is one, one example. Another example could be that in the, in the structure, I may have five residues here that are all relatively small. While the same five residues in my query may be big. Big means they occupy more space. Occupying more space means 
just reading off the coordinates is not going to work because I need more space. So rather than occupying this space, I will have to occupy this space. So I have to sort of blow it up. Now blowing it up, and that's the, it's also part of what the assessment does, uh, blowing it up means that you will get clashes. So you will get two positions that are just in the query. If you put the residue from the query in there, they are too big. So they would actually clash with each other, yes? So the question is, when I say they blow up, they don't correspond quite, does that not mean that the map is not quite right? No, because it means that essentially I picked the right coordinates, I just have to move around a little bit. There are local rearrangements. The map is wrong means that the overall trace, the fold, the, the coordinates, the overall thing of my 100 residues, that this is wrong. And that is not wrong. I just need some local rearrangements and in evolution they exactly happen. So maybe they can happen because there is some binding site that is maintained and the size changes outside of the binding site. So it's not as crucial. And that, so recognizably, if I showed you in this particular case again, so they are similar, I'm looking at details here where I see some clashes. But the map being wrong means that if I show you these two structures and you look at them, you feel that it's not the same. But it could be the same, and still there are some local clashes. All right? Uh, and then you try to sort of change the model in a way that. It's called refinement, essentially, in, in, in which you try to sort of move away from these clashes. You can imagine that this is not easy, because the moment sort of you, you have two that clash, you sort of give them more space, but that more space means you may bump against some other places, right? So you have to rearrange the whole system, and that is a CPU-intensive problem. Um, and it's also a, a, a problem that has to do with our difficulty to completely correctly describe the energy of the system. Meaning you cannot quite, what I'm saying, two negatively charged residues, uh, hydrophobic, two big residues, all of these are intuitive terms. But in the computer you really get, need to get a number and you, you have to prioritize and say, this I have to move, this is less important. So you need to rely on the ability to really phrase these images that I put forward here, size, charge, into numbers. And these, if these numbers are slightly wrong, for a system of 100 moves, uh, 100 correlated moves, this is getting very complicated, meaning we do not know the energy well enough to do that well. Uh, so you can move a little bit, but you cannot move much. When two proteins are very similar, then actually this kind of thing becomes the bottleneck of homology modeling. So finding the alignment is very easy, finding the template is very easy, reading off the coordinates, and then the, the major challenge really is exactly this, refining this model. When the two proteins, so the one that you find in the PDP and the one for which you do not have the structure, are less similar in terms of sequence identity, so this is somehow the daylight zone still, but it's at the lower end of the daylight zone, then the quality of the model becomes the problem. So the quality of the map, so you make more mistakes more examples where in fact the secondary structure will not be the same and hence the, the structure will not be the same. Then when we go further down and here sort of we enter the twilight zone, that's the point where in fact the quality of the alignment becomes a problem. Quality of the alignment means that you make mistakes in the alignment and all of this process always copies the coordinates of the corresponding point. If your alignment makes a mistake in what is the corresponding point, you're lost. Then you copied really the wrong trace, not necessarily because the two structures are not similar, but because you took the wrong part. Okay? And taking the wrong part leads to, uh, when you assess the model, to many mistakes, so many follow-up mistakes, and you cannot recover from that, except for you retry the alignment to try an alternative model and see whether that is better. And that's what modern methods do. Uh, but again, the CPU intensive and, and not completely reliable. Uh, when you go further down here into the t deep twilight zone, uh, midnight zone, is simply the, the challenge is to identify these pairs, and this is what I meant. So you can find many new pairs, you can predict structure for many new proteins if you could get down there, if you could find them. So the two main, uh, mainly used state-of-the-art models, and I just want to flash the names here, uh, are Modeler from the Charlie group, uh, 
that's online, sort of as a tool with a lot of bells and whistles for experts. Uh, so first, this is the, the template that I talked about, and the model building, model evaluation, and if it's the, then there's some assessment whether the model looks good, and if not, it redoes really all of these steps uh, in, in, in an appropriate way, and does a lot of the details up there. So this, how do you assess models? So one way is you sort of have the distance between two amino acids and a protein that is an average over many structures and then you simply sort of into this curve you see this is not a not a smooth curve right into this curve you fit your model and you already see that fitting something into this bar here is again itself a model so the assessment of how good your model is what is a clash between atoms intuitively i talked about a clash of the atoms now this is the, f the formulation or the formula underneath this idea of clash and you see there i mean there is no clear function here right it's a it's a, it's a fit um, now then you try to satisfy as many constraints that is what i said you try many alternative ways and here you see this goes into many 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 uh, iterations and if you're lucky you sort of find a local minimum uh, so again this is not guaranteed to converge this is a tricky approach then another aspect of that modeler introduced that is very important is that modeler tries to simultaneously find more than one candidate so maybe there's not only one protein of known structure, but there are several. And maybe by looking at these several, I would immediately see they have positions where they have different secondary structure or different parts. And maybe this is what I have to, in fact, begin to look for, where, where deviation happens. Um, so typical errors are misalignment, uh, the, the, the details of the way, so the amino acid, the side chain is the part of the amino acid that differs between the 20 amino acids and when I copy the coordinates I copy the part of the main amino acid but maybe the side chain then sort of orients in a wrong way or clashes against another side chain and the orientation, getting the orientation right is, is very difficult. The major problem is the wrong template problem, so you simply make the wrong decision, you have the wrong map the wrong secondary structure, so you make an initial problem. Uh, if identifying the best model, so again, the best model typically is the one of, of uh, lowest score here, and this one here is the best one in terms of the most correct one. Uh, that's the error, so the RMSD. And you see in this particular case, the score that makes you choose the right model is in fact the lowest RMS. While in this particular case here, the lowest score is not at all the lowest RMS. The lowest RMS is here, right? So sometimes your score identifies the correct model and sometimes not. So these graphs that I show you, you can of course only make when you know the answer. So these are uh, graphs that come from uh, trying out how well do we do. Now, another issue that they have is I said there are insertions. So I copy my five coordinates and my protein, my query protein has seven residues, so two additional ones. How can I model the, what I would call the loop, so the connecting bit, uh, for the additional one? Any idea? So I have two more residues. How could I find how they look? So my template in the PDB has the, the known structure for, for 50 residues. But my protein has 53. I have three additional uh, residues to model. And these three additional residues, it's not like big, it's just a, uh, assume it's a little loop that comes on top. And I know where it is because I know the coordinates, or at least I've modeled the coordinates. How could I s guess how these three look? Any idea? Yeah? Maybe I look the full, um, some residues some before, and then I that's a great idea uh, in fact people are beginning to do something like that but that's a uh, so say this this is the anchor point this is an anchor point so those I know and then there's an additional loop so what he said is maybe I look at a few of the residues before this one here and see whether there's a pattern in the whole thing and from this pattern I can see something that looks like this loop somewhere else and that gives away how the loop configuration may, may look. That would be a way, uh, it's an advanced way in the sense that you need a lot of information. Can you think about something simpler?
Yeah? Yes, so one way in which you could do that is do a molecular dynamics simulation of this loop. Uh, in fact, I will get to that in a moment. Uh, so, well, first, this is not the first thing to do. Think about something simpler that you can do. Maybe we could not have this kind of approach. So, like we say, we have three places, and then we say, okay, the possible this is there would be, like, let's say, this combination of the thousand ones, and then we say, okay, which one of them would be Yes, so exactly. You have two connecting points here, you have two constraints, you have two additional residues to put in there. I can simply look into the database. Okay, if I have these two constraints, two additional loop residues, and I know what the loop residues are. Is there any loop in the protein database that looks like my two residues that I'm adding there? And just read it off. So just take a bunch of similar loops that do this, that bridge from, from that position to that position with two residues. How do they look? Ideally you find some that have the same sequence and you find two or three that look all the same and then you know what the answer is, right? That would be the first step. The second step is what if you do not find anything in the PDB? So there is no similar loop. There is no loop from which you can model and that is exactly uh, what, what you said. Then you apply molecular dynamics and when you apply molecular dynamics these slides are in fact old now but essentially it, 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 our abilities are not that different so what it shows is the longer the loop and the length goes from 0 to 14 residues here and this is the mistake you make and the mistake sort of shoots up uh, and essentially what this one says you can do molecular dynamics if you have loops that are 5, 6, 7, 8 residues long but not longer so this is in fact also why you cannot do molecular dynamics for full length proteins because the problem simply is exploding in, in its sort of difficulty. As long as you have relatively short loop, loops, you can do molecular dynamics. So if you had a tiny protein, you could do molecular dynamics, but most proteins are, are too long for that. Another method out there is called Swiss model, uh, which as the name suggests comes from uh, Switzerland, in fact from the Schwede lab in, in Basel, also online. Now, the, bless you, the underlying philosophy of Swiss model had been a uh, completely automated tool. The underlying method or the philosophy of model had been involve experts and then sort of on the screen do the best possible modeling. Uh, and the Swiss model aspired to serve a community of people who are not experts and therefore to completely automate the approach. And ultimately, the philosophy was the, f the less we do, so putting in these loops, doing molecular dynamics simulation, looking for other loops and all of that is doing a lot. Uh, here the philosophy simply was, so to finish that sentence, the less we do, the fewer mistakes we make. Just find your template, you have a query, take Psyblast, find your template, copy the coordinates, return to the user. That essentially is the, was the original algorithm of Swiss model and that made it so successful simply because this was doable very quickly for a large number and therefore could turn into an internet server that the world could use uh, and has been using for, for now almost two decades. Uh, over time things got, got much more complicated. Today's Swiss model is in many ways similar to modelers certainly in terms of level of complexity. Now, both, so Swiss model still is sort of the more automated approach and model and more the modeling approach that people use who, who understand protein structures, uh, but they, they use very, very similar ideas. Um, some of you may have seen, uh, I, sh I should, so this is a picture from Reading Madrid. Uh, this means this, so this is French for saying this is not a pipe. So let's just stay on this one here. Um, 
This is not a pipe. What does it mean? I understand we are not in an, in an art class. <laughs> I don't understand art, yeah? This is not the actual object, right? Uh, this is an image of a, of a pipe. And the image of a pipe is not a pipe. Uh, and this is very much the point about a model that we build, a three-dimensional structure of a protein, which is a model. It's not that protein, it's an image. It's a, an approximation. And we know uh, a model must be wrong. Otherwise, it would, in fact, in some respects at least, it must be wrong. Otherwise, it would be the real thing. One way in which Thomas Schwede, so the man behind Swiss model, says that the model is a tool that helps us interpret biochemical data. So you build a model, you see some other data about function, and you see what you understand. Maybe you understand how evolutionary connected things are. Maybe you understand how some binding sites are. Maybe you understand why the drug acts to that molecule in a particular way. And that understanding gets you to possibly changing the drug when you model a drug or when you, when you develop a drug. Uh, so the model is a tool on the way of being helpful. And the most important part here is, and that is a, an idea that goes through uh, not only for computational biology but for many things. Since you know that your method makes mistakes, it's very often very helpful as a user and as a developer. When you have a prediction in front of you, ask yourself first, where are the mistakes? So what is the part in my prediction that I clearly will not trust? Or what is the part that I will trust more? This is something as a developer that you can help the user to identify. And this is something that is very important. Every model has mistakes. Again, that's the definition. So see, by and peep. Uh, this is not a pipe. Um, okay, and with that statement, we are, we are going to go into the beginning of uh, the prediction methods, the, the rudimentary prediction methods, what I left out and I forgot on the slides, and I just put it in now. So, the comparative modeling today for, is giving me a model for, I, I said we know about 111 million sequences, and the database that has these 111 million sequences is called Unipod, uh, 111 million, that's sequences, and I do know something in the ballpark of, of 120k structures, PDB I call it. Okay, so mapping this through comparative modeling leads to a situation where I can sort of predict 3D structure, build comparative models for about half of these 111 million. For every other protein in the database, 55 roughly a million, I have one region where I can make a statement about its three-dimensional structure through comparative modeling. And that's an immense number. So you can boost from the 120,000 for which you have experimental information to 55 million for which you can predict something about structure. And that is in fact the most powerful tool that exists. I'm just, it's the most important tool in structure prediction, uh, and I'm just glossing over it because um, it, it is something that, that to understand is relatively simple. There's a lot of bells and whistles and modeler and uh, Swiss model that in order to understand what they do and how they are helping, you would need to be a computational biologist and would, be, would have to be more an expert in the field. And I believe this is not the right avenue to, to proceed under. By the way, it does not mean that 50% of the hundreds so or 55 million proteins are completely predicted in their 3D structure. There's one region. Since most proteins have more than two domains, this one region typically is one domain or a sub-fragment of a domain. So typically most of these, even in these 55 million, most of the protein is still not known. Anyway, for at least half of the pi, or more, not all more, but more than half of the pi, we do not know 3D structure by comparative modeling, nor by experiment, and we cannot predict it. What we can predict is a simplified version. It's 1D structure. And that is the part uh, with which I will go into the next two weeks. 
how can we predict 1D structure, for instance, secondary structure, from sequence? Secondary structure, again, the word, uh, often people use the acronym secondary structure, and because of secondary, they use the term 2D structure. 2D is misleading. 2D is, for me, 2D is two-dimensional. Two-dimensional are contacts, are distances. It's the distance map here where every single residue is in the proximity to every other single residue. Secondary structure is assigned by looking at contacts in a local environment or even global, a more global environment for beta strands. But it's still, ultimately, at the end of the day, when you write down the secondary structure of a protein, such as here in this line, so uh, residue 1 to blah blah blah, could, uh, writes in this direction here from 1 to 50 or whatever the number is. Uh, e means extended, blind means loop, often called loop, so it's not helix, not strand. Uh, and you see it's a string. Secondary structure is a string. Okay, that's very important. And back again, here's the point that I, the slides that I didn't, that I didn't remember I have in here. So if the entire pie here is the percentage of proteins, here percentage of residues, for about half you can uh, have th 3D predictions to compare modeling. For more than half you don't. On the level of the residues, the, the no don't part is a little bit larger. Uh, okay, so one way of doing secondary structure prediction is that I take my 3D structure from the PDP, I assign through DSSP secondary structure, DSSP assigns it in uh, eight states shown here, and we, I will transfer these eight states into sort of major stage, states. This is all helix. Uh, this is what I'm going to call extended, the E and the B. So this is the beta strand, and everything else here I will call loop. Loop is just sort of a mix. It should have. So the, the field most often uses loop, actually, is other. Helix is well defined, strand is well defined, everything else is not. It's just a mixture of other things. So other would be the right term. Uh, now, the people who developed DSSP, uh, Wolfgang Kapsch and, and Chris Sander, they early on looked at longer peptides, so stretches of amino acids, and they observed that all of these here are always found in the alpha helix those in the beta strand, those, bless you, those in the state other, and then there were penta peptides. Penta is sort of five, five residue long things that were found to be in some proteins in a helix and some other proteins to be in a beta strand. How could that be? So today we know many more of these. This is just the first such discovery. Uh, and we know that these switch regions, as they are sometimes called, in fact, can be longer than five. They can be uh, more than 11 residues long. Any, any idea? How could that be? How could the same five residues, V and T, F, V, and one part of the protein, they form a helix, or another protein, they form a beta strand? How could that be? Any idea? Yeah? So it, is be, it could be because the parts that bring, it, that bring it together are different. So helices are stabilized by, by I and I plus 4 relatively local interaction. Beta strands are stabilized by more global ones. But imagine that you have a part where, in fact, in one protein, the binding strand is there. And another protein, the binding strand, is not there. It's just uh, this part here is missing, so this one here cannot bind in that direction. And maybe then it would adopt the beta, uh, helix. Okay, this example is not a good one because this one is still bound in this, this direction. But this one would be a good one. This is not bound. So if this one would, would be missing, then this possibly could, in a different environment, uh, adopt the helix simply because the binding interactions it has or the local environment for binding is different. And that's exactly the explanation that, that we have. Uh, 